All right. So, uh, NVK, this is, this has been a conversation that I'm kind of blown away that it's taken us this long to put it down, uh, on the recorder. Um, but man, welcome to the show. So excited to have you here. You're such a wealth of knowledge. So I'm sure this is just going to be a really fun conversation for both of us. Hey man, uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's a, it's my pleasure. It's one of my favorite pods. Hey, uh, this is where I want to start this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, entropy dice. Right. I find this just fascinating that you have a product for this. And, um, and I, like, I mean, I understand that just the stupid basics, like at the most elementary level of why these exist, and it gets into the elliptical curve uh, key generation, right? But help us, help us just understand what that buzzword even means, right? The fact that you went out and created a uh, product around this and why there needs to be a product around it, in your opinion. And then lastly, not that I'm trying to like give you all these questions at once, but is this how you generate your own keys? Yeah. So this is, it's funny. I mean, no wonder you said that I was going to be surprised by the first question. That's, <laughs> that's starting like right there. Um, so, you know, cryptography, uh, like especially publicly cryptography, uh, requires a very, very big number, right? A random big number, right? And that's the basis that you build all your math on top to create your secrets, right? To, to sort of or operate on top of your secrets, right? So essentially, because actually, let me backtrack this a bit. So a password, right? A password is not really the basis of any secret of the information that you're trying to store, right? You know, a password is just how you are encapsulating something encrypted right and that's the secret that sort of like breaks that that sort of shield out to see something that's inside in bitcoin the secret is the money right so the the stakes are much higher because if somebody can break that because they know the public part already they already know the information it's already out there so if somebody could break or reverse that right and and, and find the original secret they can spend your money so in bitcoin the secret or 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 the the quality of the entropy that the secret has is it's like one of the most important things is the basis of everything security wise in bitcoin self custody right so um what happens is how do you create a random number it sounds like an easy problem but it's not right because so if you are a enterprise solution, right? Uh, uh, you know, and they have been having to create big numbers, big entropy for you know like fifty years, and you know that's how they protect banks and that's how they protect the airplanes and all this stuff, right? So what they do is they will use this uh, FIPS as a certification, right? By the NIST, each you're you're uh, a serviceman, you would know, uh, and they certify the little tiny computers that generate uh, like the gates on a chip that, that generate that, that random number, right? Randomly. And, you know, some of them we use different, different things. Some of them we use heat. Some of them we use noise, any kind of noise because noise is entropy, right? Now it gets really tricky because most things that you believe are entropically good actually are not. If you observe them for long enough, you find patterns. Right. And if you know those patterns, you could try to reverse engineer which number was created. So it, it's a massive problem. So much so that, like, when you're talking about true, deep, deep secrets, uh, like the, the army sort of like main secrets, they will use uh, uh, atomic decay uh, as a means of finding true entropy, is one of the best sources of it. But, you know, that's completely unrealistic for the average person to have, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> some apparatus that measures that at home. So, what do we do? Um, in Bitcoin, we go and we have, we have very good, well-reviewed uh, well crypto libraries that try to do a very good job at, at like spotting bad sort of means of generating that entropy 
uh, uh, or generating that secret, right? But you still have to feed it something, right? Uh, on a computer, you're going to feed some of the, the noise from the computer and, and you know, Bitcoin Core is going to use like uh, some well sort of researched libraries to do that, right? Um, but you can't really fully trust that either, right? Uh, because you don't know if the computer is not lying to you, right? This is the biggest problem that Bitcoiners have is that like, uh, do I have one here? Um, I don't, I, I, I can't really trust the device, right? That's the whole goal is not to trust the device. So what we do is we essentially take the entropy from dice. So you throw dice, right? And out of 99 dice throws, you have, uh, you have 256 bits of entropy, right? Which is the full amount of entropy you need for a Bitcoin private key. And, you know, cold card can generate the private key for you, can generate the entropy for you. We do a very good job at that. But having the option for you to be able to enter your own de-risks one us. There is less interest in uh, actors to try to compromise us as a company, right? Because now they know that, you know, most users are not going to trust us anyways. Um, and then the next step is, okay, great. So I'm entering the dice entropy into the device, right? How do I know that the device is showing me the correct entropy is not just lying to me about the dice that I threw for it? We have a companion script that you can run on, say, a, a, a Tails CD or some other machine, and you can enter at the same time. And because this is deterministic, you can actually generate the same seed and you can actually compare. So you can validate that the device is doing what it claims it does. And we are getting at a level of security that like it beats almost anything that a state actor has, right? With all their disposable by just being like honest, verifiably honest. Being really rudimentary in the way that you're doing it, yes. I think is really kind of, the the simplicity in using the dice is actually just it, you can't replicate that in any kind of way. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, good luck trying to replicate ninety nine dice throws, right? I mean, yeah. even if the dice were biased, you're still fine. Yeah, yeah. No, this is something that whenever I I was studying for uh, an interview I was doing with quantum computing. And when I was when I was studying this, I, I realized that really kind of the 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 most vulnerable part of your private keys and your Bitcoin is in that key generation process that you just kind of really went into a lot of depth describing. Um, and so it, I realized that it came down to the random numbers that that are being generated by the computer, and, and we'll say random in quotes. Um, because like you like you so eloquently pointed out, there's ways to kind of reverse engineer that pattern that kind of pops out of the way that those random numbers are being generated. And without, you know, a lot of effort being placed into making sure that that the number that's coming up with, and you're you're saying what how big is how many digits is this big number, this quote unquote big number that's being generated? Like how it's, many it's, it's big. It's it'll be like how many digits would you say? I, I don't know. Uh, it's 256 a bits. lot. It's 256 so, bits. Okay. Yeah. So, like, it's, if you it's, had it's a huge number. So, on the dice, you're dealing with nine digit dice or 10 digit dice, including no, the six. zero or six. six. six yeah, that's the D6 okay. standard dice. Okay. Just a standard die. Okay. Yeah. You remember, right? Because it compounds, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. We, uh, wow. we have this. It's kind of cool. And, and I'm, I'm very lazy. So, uh, uh, and I didn't want to throw like, you know, dice like a hundred times. So we, we found the smallest dice that could possibly be bought. They're like five millimeters big and mm -hmm. it comes in a bag of 100. So you just hmm. throw it once. You just throw, <laughs> throw it one time and then, and then just what are you, you doing? You're numbers. just, you're just randomly selecting the numbers. No, no, right. you pick, no, never humans cannot do entropy. Y y if I tell you to give me a, a, a random number, it's probably not random. So you, you, you literally read each dice and you input each digit digital, digital, digitally. Well, and what, I guess what I, was, what I was getting at was you're just, 
<laughs> I'm going to use this word randomly just grabbing whatever dice yeah. off the table and you're just kind of compiling those numbers, right. 99 of them, six digit numbers. And that is how you're coming up with your key generation. So is this, is this how you did your own? In, in oh, your uh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I would never. Yeah. I, I mean, it depends. Right. So I, I don't believe there is like a, a single solution to rule them all. Right. So, you know, I have many hardware wallets, right. Some are deep cold, some are semi cold, some are operational, you know, like, and, you know, for an operational wallet, the, the one you use every day, you know, with like smaller funds, I don't care. I'll just sort of let the device generate it. I'll, I'll give myself less work. But the, the idea is to really trust, minimize it, right? That That's like, because nothing is proof, right? So it, it's always just trust minimizing is the, the goal uh, uh, of, of our company. All right. I just had to, I had to ask that first because <laughs> when, I, when I've observed some of yours and I have your, your block clock sitting here, there's so many things that we can talk about, but this is the one that I've just always kind of smiled at and just had deep admiration for the level to which you are willing to go with your products and with your company to ensure that uh, people's security is at the highest level possible if they choose to take it there. Right. And I just have, a deep admiration for that. But um, here's my next, when did you come into the space? Cause I'm not, I know you came in very early, but w when did you come into this space? And, um, and then I want to kind of talk about how you build a company around it. Yeah. So, so I mean, coming into the space in the early days is, is like a, it's a, it's like a, a complicated question because it's like, um, y you know, I, I got into the space when, when the Satoshi paper came out on slash dot, um, you know, and, and then it's like, this is, this is some insane idea, right? Like, I, I mean, I, I still, to this day, I just laugh if anybody pre certain, you know, pre 2012 sort of like said that this thing is like a certainty, like, you know, they're like, either oh, poor yeah. shit or like, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> in, you know, in 2010, it's like, okay, great. Like some Satoshi guy wrote some paper that's very interesting and there is absolutely no way this thing is going to work. Right. Uh, but it was very interesting and, and it was interesting to see the stuff starting to form and like, and people start to use. Um, I mean, our first project was launched, I think, uh, end of 2011. Uh, you know, we were still working in other companies and sort of like still doing other stuff. And, but, you know, but the first little sort of like, uh, like attempt at doing something in Bitcoin, I think might have been uh, early, yeah, like late 2011 kind of thing. Uh, what was, was the product? Was early days. Uh, oh, it was a btclook.com. Uh, okay. It was a block explorer oh. for Bitcoin transactions. In those days, the block, the entire blockchain was maybe like 11 megabytes, 11 gigabytes or something, or, or, or 30 gigabytes. I can't remember. It could fit in a, uh, a, in, a, in a normal computer RAM. So we ran the whole blockchain Redis and you could like do all this cool like visualizations of it. It was fun. Uh, it was the project that we did to sort of understand Bitcoin. Um, hmm. Yeah. When did you decide that you were going to uh, do the hardware wallet? Um, so the first thing that sort of like, and, and this is me and Doc Hex, uh, uh, my co-founder. Uh, uh, we were sort of like looking at this stuff as like, okay, great. Um, you know, money is in the computer. If I send money, it goes to another computer. There's no middleman. Wonderful. Bitcoin is for payments, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so we created like uh, this Bitcoin debit cards uh, and Bitcoin payment terminals. Uh, and we started sort of deploying them around the world uh, in like late uh, 2012 kind of thing. Um, and, you know, there were kind of like PCI certified payment terminals that we sort of got them done and, and uh, the hardware was ours. Uh, and, uh, and it was a little too early, <laughs> uh, but we had to, to essentially be the back end for all this stuff. Right. So we started creating the, the hardware secure, uh, security modules, right. The, the HSM servers, because neither tails nor the other company that I forget now the name had any servers, any secure security servers that could do the Bitcoin curve. Uh, the Bitcoin curve is not FIP certifiable. Maybe it is now. I don't even know anymore. Uh, it wasn't at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we needed secure servers. 
uh, and then we sort of ran with that. And then the company started to become more like of a online wallet solution. And then essentially like Big Go before Big Go, it was the back end for a lot of exchanges. Uh, and then uh, and then we sort of decided that one, that was not profitable enough. And two, was not like I didn't want to be a centralized point of failure. Like yeah. receiving letters and things was not my shtick. So uh, we move on to focus only on hardware. Yeah. Yeah. You know, back then, um, I know whenever I first came into the space, like there really wasn't a lot of confidence that, that you could scale so that you could get to the instant payment par- portion that you have with Lightning now. And, um, you know, building like the product that you're talking about, I'm sure the biggest concern really had to have been wrapped around this idea that you needed 10 minutes on average for just a, a clearance, assuming you can get into the next block. So, how are you guys thinking about that at that point in time in the business and thinking about how it could possibly scale? Like, what were you, what were your thoughts so at it, the time? It, it's kind of funny. Uh, so, we, we let the, the, let's see if I have a card here. Uh, well, actually, I do. Uh, so, this, this were the, the debit cards. Um, oh, okay. And, uh, you could uh, essentially there were a few things, right? Because the the cards didn't have a private key in themselves; they were essentially just authentication to get into the big system. Mm-hmm. Um, you could do user to user instant transfers, right? If they were within the the same system. Um, if you were paying from another wallet to the terminal, um, you know the merchant had a, an option to choose how many confirmations he wanted. We explained, right, that like zero confirmations is concerns. Uh, you know, it's not your Bitcoin until it's confirmed. <laughs> so, but you know, people buying coffee and stuff, who cares, right? I mean, it's like, what, you're going to lose a dollar? Somebody tried to do a double spend attack at a merchant? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of unrealistic. And this is before transaction malleability too. Uh, so it was possible to do that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, that's when some of the coins were sort of starting to come and uh, uh, poop coins. Sorry, this is a kid friendly show. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, I, you know, in my mind at that time it was like, OK, great. So you have like Bitcoin, 10 minutes a block. And then you have, say, Litecoin, right, which had enough security at the time. Uh, you know, I think it was like two, three minutes a block. I can't remember anymore. But you no, know, it was enough. So, like, you know, maybe use this stuff for payments that are instant. Maybe use this stuff for the other. But people are really going to want to store their money in Bitcoin. Um, so, so we just sort of like gave options to the people to choose because a lot of people were using those terminals not for retail. They're using those terminals as a means of being sort of Western Union. Uh, 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 transfers, right? Because yeah, you yeah. could print paper wallets, you could sort of onboard new Bitcoiners into the system uh, and, and or withdraw, really. You could get a whole private key out in a QR from the machine. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, it was a mixed bag, right? Because it, it's easy now to see Bitcoin as a store of value, right? But in those days, maybe I think like the only person I remember saying that was like Trace Mayer. Trace Mayer, <laughs> <Like>, yeah. <laughs> everybody else was saying Bitcoin is payments, right? And yeah. and you know, it, it, it's 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 hard because it was just so unclear uh, what 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 he best did like as a as a utility. Yeah. No, you're right. Trace was pretty much the only guy out there saying those things. So, uh, what time frame did you uh, develop the calculator? I love, I love this design. I'm just gonna tell you right now, like this is this. this this is the best design ever that you have. This hardware <laughs> wall looking like a calculator. When did you when know, did you produce this? Um, so okay, so OpenDime must have been 2016, 2017. I think we launched Cold Card around 2018, yeah. 2019, around that time. It sounds uh, right. Because that's when we closed our other system finally. No, the system was closed 2016, maybe. Uh, anyways, we were in flux even with our own stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And and I'm like, you know, I, I was not very sort of satisfied with, with the options in the market. And we created this just for ourselves, really. Um, and then there was enough demand and we sort of, you know, started to make it into a product. Uh, Open Dime was the product that the company was making and selling at that time. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we figured, uh, hey, you know, a we need a good hardware wallet that respects certain principles that we like. It's our preference, our sets of trade offs. Uh, and uh, and Cold Card was born. 
And and by the way, I just heard American Hoddle paid uh, Peter McCormick with uh, one of the uh, open dimes on his show just this week. <laughs> That's uh, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people, it, it's it's surprising, like the, the amount of those devices in the market and, and how much people yeah. actually use them. Like, yeah, it, it's instant. Uh, 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 it's already confirmed, right? It's a pre-confirmed UTXO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like for people that don't understand, that's like a, an unspent Bitcoin is in there, right? And, and you can trust when you're receiving anyway. It's, it's just fun. Awesome. That's awesome. How about the clock? So first, the, the first question I got for you is, <laughs> What did you do when you were watching Jack Dorsey testifying before Congress? And there's your clock <laughs> behind him. Like you had to just been laughing. Like what, what was your reaction when you were watching this? So it, it was funny because um, I think it was a year or two prior to that, I had, I had dinner with him uh, uh, and, uh, you know, met the guy first time was sort of out yeah. of the blue, uh, super nice guy. And, you know, we, gave him some some products block clock didn't exist yet uh, at least not the the mini and then you know sort of time passes and all sort of exchanging messages here and there and uh you know i'm watching the thing and it's like huh? is that uh, <laughs> so it's, you didn't even know he had it no i i had no idea <laughs> uh, it, it like um it was it was totally like you know uh uh, uh it was a funny surprise um, it was funny because, you know, like what a better way of sending a message to the, 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 the those guys than like, look, it, it, you know, there is like sats and it's sats dollar. Like, it, it, you know, like it's I not know. that that's, that's a, and then you cannot ask for anything better than some crazy person to create a conspiracy with Russia around. Them, oh my right? God. So people who are listening to this might not be familiar with, with what happened here. So uh, Jack goes on, he's testifying in front of Congress. I, I think it's all about like just the the censorship on social media is, is what I'm assuming that it was about. I don't remember. But uh, in the background, he has this block clock that MVK and his team there have have manufactured, designed, manufactured, and, and has on the market. I have one actually sitting right in front of me right now. Um, and instead of it, you know, posting like the price of Bitcoin, Jack had his set up to uh, display the 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 value of Bitcoin in satoshis per uh, dollars per satoshi, right? So, or the other way around, satoshis per dollar. So he had, uh, you know, at the time it might have been like twenty three hundred sats per dollar, right? And uh, following the the appearance on C SPAN or whatever it was, there was a person on Twitter. Who's there talking about how Jack Dorsey has the time in Moscow in his behind him? <laughs> so all these Bitcoiners are on Twitter. <laughs> all these Bitcoiners are on Twitter, and they're like, "No, bro, I'm sorry, it's it's not Moscow time. That is the price of satoshis per dollar." And this guy and he wouldn't is, believe. He, this he guy, no, no, he doubled down. He, doubled, he quadrupled down. He's was he was some kind of journalist, right? I, um, I don't know. Some, I don't yeah. know what he was, but he had he had a fairly decent sized following, and so the whole Bitcoin Twitter, you know, laser eyed <laughs> obnoxiousness uh, swarms this guy. And we're like, no, we know the guy that made the clock, and like, in fact, here he is. And then you were you were in there, and the whole bit, and the guy just refused. <laughs> refused. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so how does how does NVK respond to this? Well, I'll tell you how he responds to it. He rolls out a software update so that you can <laughs> and hold on one second. I just want to make sure mine is in Moscow time, sir. Um, he rolls out a soft software update that says, instead of it saying sats per uh, dollars, it says, it just says Moscow time and then it has the price in sats per dollar. Still it's the sats per dollar, but this is, this is brilliant. This is your, this is how you're having fun. This is how you're, you know, just like, I can't even imagine the marketing that came out of this and it wasn't like you were planning it or anything, but it was just brilliant. It was hilarious. It's fun. Yeah. It, it, you know, <laughs> it, this is, this is kind of how we see like all this stuff is, you know, we, we only come to the office, like, which we don't have one, um, you know, because it's, this is, this is my hobby, right? Like <laughs> my hobby is to make stuff. 
right? Yeah. Uh, um, we we yeah we, we just we just love what we do. It's awesome, and it was uh, it was sure a lot of fun. So uh, NVK, how would you um, make Bitcoin cheap to transact for the unbanked uh, locations in the world? So, um, so this this two cards are what we think is sort of like the game changer. Right. I mean, this one has cryptography art on it. Um, we found that like Open Dime is like a fantastic solution. People loved it and people were trying to use them in developing countries, but like it's just too expensive, the device, right? Like, I mean, we just couldn't do it. So after a lot of sort of sourcing and trying to figure out, we found a chip that could do NFC and the security in the way that we want it at a cost that we could like drastically decrease. Uh, and also make it reusable. What do you mean by the NFC part? So this is a tap card. It's a contactless mm -hmm. card. So you just tap it on your phone. Mm -hmm. And essentially, this is how you can transact Bitcoin. Um, you load the card with Bitcoin. There's going to be a QR on the back. This one is inactivated. Um, and that's it. You, you just you give this to somebody. They don't have to trust you. And they can just take the card. And that's it. Like the transaction is done. That it's already in the cart. And so if I'm if I'm receiving this payment, or I'm say I'm requesting ten dollars worth of satoshis, right? So I would type in to my device that I want that many sats, which would be what? How many sats would that be? Twenty thousand sats or something. Yeah. So I'd put that there, and uh, and then you just hold the card up to my device, and then I would I would see that it was paid. How would that so, what would that look like? So think about it this way. Um, you could just send it to the card. Say the person doesn't even have a wallet. Let's mm -hmm. say you want to give it to your cousin some Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you want to do it in front of him. So you can give him the card. You take a picture of the card with the QR or the tap and you send Bitcoin to it. Done. He has Bitcoin. He doesn't need to understand. He doesn't have to have a wallet. Nothing. But he has the private key. This is non-custodial. Mm. Right? And whenever he wants to spend it, he just taps on an app and puts the pin that's on the back and he spends the card. Wow. Um, now, imagine you have a stack of these preloaded with like whatever amount you want or denomination you want, right? And you can go and you can say like, you know what? Like here's a 10 cards of 100, just a gift cards, but it's Bitcoin. And then if the person receives these, they can spend it, but then they can generate a new private key on them. They don't get the QR. The QR is fixed to the first one. But like, if you can do it 10 times. You can have 10 private keys in a card. And then... This is yeah, that's wild. That's just unbelievable. And, and the key here is it's going to cost less than $10, right? So say you want to donate this to some cause you want um you, you know like you don't have to worry about privacy there's no privacy implication right and the person receiving this can just give this to the next person they don't need to spend it right so you can have an old utxo here an old bitcoin in this card just passing around for years and years and years without ever being spent there's no cost to transact now it, it gets interesting, right? Because you have a Bitcoin private key here. So we made another variation of this that this one essentially behaves like a normal wallet. And you can essentially use this for multi-sig. So you can just tap it with other wallets or you can authenticate with your phone. You can authenticate with anything that is an FC. And y you just... You just don't need to understand Bitcoin anymore. You know, it's nice. Yeah, it's we just... want people to understand it. But like, and it functions off of the web too. So you, you, you have a website that if you tap this, these ones are not active. But if you tap it on the phone, um, a website tells you if the card is valid or not because you can check the cryptography of it. Um, and in good uh, Coinkite fashion is you don't have to trust us either. Well, there's a level of trust, but the, the trust is minimized because um, we use a block nonce as part of the entropy. So it's provable that we don't know 
mm. the private key. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's just that, like, you know, Open Dime was fun and all. I'm still going to sell it. But it's just I couldn't make it scale to, like, a billion people, right? Yeah. This, yeah. That, this is a card with yeah. a chip that I can get a billion made. Like, it, yeah. and, and that's it. It's like... And, and the cost is just lower and lower and lower and lower. I can get economies of scale on this that are different. Uh, and you can get artists on this. You can, you know, it's just, it's a whole different universe uh, of scale uh, that, that like, I think we can finally serve people that don't necessarily even want to understand Bitcoin. When does this roll out? Uh, we actually announced the, the, SDK for devs to start implementing this on wallets. Uh, so it, it's open, right? So it's going to function with any wallet that wants to work with this, essentially. Um, and uh, the software is done mostly uh, for the cards. The cards are functional. Um, I think in just a, like a few months, should be out, out the door. Who knows? Maybe by Bitcoin Miami, I already have some, but I just don't want to promise. But it's uh, wow. it's done. That's why we got the laser machine in the airplane. Congrats! That's amazing. Yeah, it should it should be fun. We'll send you some when we have it. I'd love to receive it. Loaded, of course. <laughs> 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 there might be some money transmitter thing there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't load it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he does ship on a card, like oh. like. People don't understand, like, shipping physical things, it's a problem, right? Yeah. Uh, this goes in an envelope. Like, you can ship anywhere in the world. Unreal. Um, yep. It should be fun. Here's a question for you that I think that you're one of the few people that I know I can ask this question to and, and get a, a really profound response. How do, how do Bitcoiners harden the network from a... Uh, from a transmission and, and reception standpoint, uh, if internet service providers go down. And, and let me give you a, an example. For people that are listening to this, um, over in Kazakhstan, they had the internet service providers turned off. They went, they're going through a, um, a conflict with their politicians and overthrow. And um, I was participating in a, in a spaces chat and one of the guys is like, hey, you know, it's really cool that Blockstream has a satellite, but all we can really use it for is kind of uh, knowing where the, the current block is. It's not like we can actually transmit to it. It's only in, in the, the satellites broadcasting the blockchain. It's sending, but it has no receive uh, mechanism. So, And on top of that, he didn't have any type of, even if it would, he didn't have a, a satcom set up in order to transmit or any of that stuff. So here's here's a guy who's able to pull uh, four cent per kilowatt hour electricity in his mining facility, which is extremely cheap for anybody who's um, you know mining. But he can't submit block because he doesn't have an internet connection. How like what can be done in order to harden this network and make it more robust so that that type of scenario, which could happen anywhere in the world right now, based on things we're seeing, um, <laughs> which we'll get to later, I'm sure. Um, how can we, how can we harden this network? You, you know, it, it, it's hard to explain to people that, you know, modern nations cannot just flip the switch. Okay. Like, you, you know, your G20 countries, which is where most of the wealth is anyways, uh, can't just turn off the internet, okay? Just, I, I just like starting from that premise just so people understand because, you know, that's how the banking system works. That's how the stock system works. That's how every single Fortune 500 company that pays all the taxes works. It, it wants, so like, you just can't just like press a button. But let's, let's do the game theory, right? Like, so fine, let's say, you know, Canada, we're under dictatorship right now. Um, let's say, you, you know, dear leader Trudeau uh, decides to turn off, to, to flip the switch, right? So so what does Rodolfo do? Um, well, you know, uh, I have my, my ham radio set up, right? I can, I can transmit in, in many different types of, of frequency bands, right? Some are better, some are worse. 
I do have, you know, the Blockstream satellite. It's kind of off right now, but so I can receive blocks. Uh, if they if they try to jam Qban, right, which is the satellite dish sort of band, which they could. State actors have the capabilities of doing that kind of stuff. Um, you know, uh, I probably you would use maybe pigeons with micro SD cards um, because it's a lot of data. But so so let's assume that I can I can receive right. So I'm receiving from from the satellite. Um, now you know I, I check the blocks. I sign a transaction. Then what do I do? Well. I find a counterparty that could relay this transaction for me in a different country, right? Through ham radio. I'll transmit to him the, the data and he'll simply broadcast a transaction for me. And then it would show up from satellite on my desktop saying that it's fine. So, yeah. you, you know, you can resolve this stuff uh, fairly uh, uh, reasonably. You know, does, does it create a lot of nonsense? Does it create a lot of friction? Yes. But am I capable of transacting yes right um and you know let's expand this a little more right let's say for example you, you know they're now say jamming uh, uh um uh, hf right so the frequencies that go very far okay great so now you know you go closer to the border and you get some some americans in buffalo to point uh uh, uh to point their 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 uh high gain wi-fi antennas or all their stuff that the you know the government just don't want to like just just fully jam because um, you know they're going to jam their own stuff and you can try to get data out in and out that way and they can broadcast it for me right um, and we do see this in many countries right like that that do have issues with government sort of uh, 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 um, governments trying to to block things um, you know in a way I think. Modern rich countries just can't handle like this. They just can't do this kind of new senses because their economies will just absolutely like implode immediately. Uh, but it is a nice exercise, right? It's nice to know that you're capable of. Maybe there's a national, there's a catastrophe, right? There's a disaster. Maybe your Pickering uh, uh, atomic plant explodes, uh, and you know, like you still need to sort of maybe receive Bitcoin or send Bitcoin. Uh, you you can do that. Right. I, I mean, the, the first responders in any disaster are hand radio operators, <laughs> you know, like they're the first people online. And, and uh, it's just nice to know that you have a money now that can also sort of flow through the same comms. So in the first uh, scenario that you were talking about, as far as sending it to a friend and then they would uh, submit the, uh, the 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 block for you uh, that you discovered as the correct solution. Uh, through your guessing, through your mining, um, in that scenario, you're you're suggesting that you would use HF, oh. or would you use a different frequency, or would you send it via text message? Like, how would you how would you transmit I, that? I don't. We, we don't having a, a setup that's already pre set up. Let's put it this way: something that's already like yeah, uh, high availability and essentially high speed. Uh, everything travels at the speed of sound, right? It is digital. Sorry, this is the speed of light because mm -hmm. it is digital. So th there is no difference between a, a radio transmission, regardless of power, okay, and the transmission of something going through copper, right? So mm -hmm. through Ethernet to the sense, just so people understand, it's no. But the problem the is my, the amount of data that's being sent is what's this limited. is the issue, yeah. right? Yeah. So transmitting a whole block is going to take a while in HF. You know, through Wi-Fi through the border will be fairly quick. Uh, you know, maybe it's three G, maybe it's five G. You know, whatever connection you can. Um, I think transacting, you're, you're totally fine. There is a million ways to get in and out. Hey, everybody. It's Trey Lockerbie from the We Study Billionaires podcast here to tell you about Titan. If you're ready to invest but not really sure where to start, Titan takes all the guesswork out of investing by actively managing your money for you. With Titan, you can ride shotgun along with a team of dedicated, experienced analysts as they allocate your money for you and let you in along the way. Titan is the first investment platform for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experts. They offer three equity portfolios and America's first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of four portfolios on an after fees basis. They aim to grow your investments 15% annually, which would imply that you're doubling your wealth every five years net of fees. You'll even see exactly how your money is managed through video, audio, and written updates on their mobile app. 
Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you use my URL linked in the description below, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. Miners would have a harder time because they are also competing with others, right? So if they don't get that block out fast, right, somebody else will probably find a block before they broadcast it out. So, and that that was kind of the essence of my question. And but I I see where you're going with this because anywhere else in the world it can continue to mine. It's is it really an issue? And I, it's it's really not, is it? No, uh, I mean I'm a big fan of making blocks smaller, which is another conversation. If blocks <laughs> were smaller, yeah, then we we could just buy all the old AM radio stations in the whole world and just broadcast Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come through your little AM radio and you're done. Like, I, I mean, it, it's just so simple. But I got to say, with the, with the existing block size, it's just like, it's just on the edge of, of like, what do you want to do on, on those 10 minutes in data? But it, again, it, it's really a non-factor for mining, for submitting right. blocks as, via mining, because you're always going to have somebody in the world that's mining it without, with, with no restriction. It, and it is decentralized. I mean, China did that, right? It wasn't through cutting off the internet, but they literally made mining illegal. And then we had a massive hash rate oh, drop. Yeah. Bitcoin survived. It actually yeah. went up in price. Easily. <laughs> right? yeah. And then the mining equipment moved. I, I mean, you, you know, moving things in and out of places that are under distress is not exactly a new thing. There have been dictatorships and bad places in the world forever, and people somehow find a way, right? But it, as far as software that's written, for a country in distress with internet service provider cutting off access, it, it doesn't seem like there is kind of like a go-to software solution, whether you're submitting that over HF or you're uh, doing it via text message that's kind of in place for well, countries that, would, that might be going through a scenario like that, correct? There used to be a number for you to text transactions to, if I remember right, way back in the day that hmm. would broadcast for you. Hmm. Um, uh, I don't know who ran that number, but it was around. Um, it's just, you know, it, it becomes sort of like unused enough. And then I think this projects die. Right. Um, that's why like, it, it's kind of like the ham radio stuff, right? So most people have is collecting dust. Uh, it's just nice to have it if, if you ever need. And, and, but the cool thing about the, the ham stuff is that you don't need specialized software, right? We already have, uh, 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 uh FLDG. Uh, and a few other sort of like uh, uh, digital to analog converters, Got right? It. That you just, you dump a file. And right? it just it spews it, it out. Just, yeah. In, I mean. In R2-D2 uh, type way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, so it, it's exactly that. And so if you're a sailor, right? Uh, people who do transatlantic sailing and stuff, they yeah. have what this thing called wind tour. Um, mm. and, and it's essentially email over ham radio. Oh, Okay. And there is lots of stations around the world that just rebroadcast those emails for them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't think people realize the range on HF. I mean, it depends on which band you're going into and the at atmospherics and things like that, but you can get 3,000 kilometers out of, uh, out of the HF. Oh, much more. Band. Yeah. I, I, can, I can reach Japan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, from, from Canada, know, yeah. From Canada with very little like power. Gain, yeah. Uh, so, you know, like it's actually very hard for a state actor to find, uh, uh, through like advanced comm recognition, right. Mm -hmm. They, they can normally find, uh, uh, people, uh, um, broadcasting, uh, but like a low power, it becomes very hard. You get, you get lost in the noise. How long do you think it would take for you to transmit a block in HF? If you, if you started it, uh, I think it, it, it it depends on the frequency because essentially uh, the, the, the higher the frequency, the more bandwidth you have. So essentially so the three faster, megahertz. The, three yeah, megahertz. So essentially, oh, three, uh, three megahertz would probably take about seven minutes. Oh, wow. It'd take that long. Yeah. And, and then okay. there is like the radio is going to please stop. Please. And that, yeah, that's assuming you're going to get the, yeah, the yeah. whole transmission comes <laughs> no, through. Yeah. Cause, cause like yeah. the difference between voice and data is that data is constant, right? It's really like the load of the radio is full. So the, the radio is going to be like, please make this stop. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody on that 
frequencies like what the hell is going on that's right all right okay um so we were talking about this a little bit and and i'm trying to keep it as politically agnostic as possible but uh it's a little hard with this one things things up in canada are getting pretty crazy so we everybody's familiar with the uh truckers they the the government's response the government steps in uh the the part where i think it's just kind of got outrageous is shutting down the bank accounts going after anybody who's provided a financial contribution to this protest um and it seems like uh, tonight uh i saw some charts that uh it's basically a bank run right like what's going yeah. on so we we don't know what's going on with the, the banking thing i mean it was just a glitch between the major Canadian four banks <laughs> <laughs> all you at know, the maybe, same time <laughs> yeah maybe the mainframe uh, uh uh you know crashed um i don't know i i kind of had a theory i think that maybe they were running the the donor list against the the banks db at the same time uh and and maybe that's what caused that but you know banks have a lot of data per day so like maybe you know it's unlikely i i, I don't know i i have no idea wow. what's going on with the banking thing but what an, ad, a what an ad for Bitcoin up in Canada. Every, yeah. Everybody up in Canada is going to be a Bitcoiner. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you know, you have like, you know, the deputy minister sort of like going on TV and saying that, you know, essentially we can't do anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> like, you know, thank you for explaining to people why people that have a different opinion may want to not bank. Um, yeah, no, it, it, it's uh, the context of this whole thing here is even like more stupid too, right? I, I mean... Canada is essentially having a deplorables moment, mm. right? The the political sort of political class here, I don't think I've ever had a non-woke, uh, a big uh, movement happening politically, right? And, and, and I think, and the truckers are not exactly polished, small guys, right? So like, you know, you have these big guys who are not going to budge, with this massive rigs honking downtown now for three weeks. Um, Has it and, been and that think, long? Has it been that yeah, long? That, been, oh, I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah, they took the wheels off of some of them. So, oh, and and, and this is this wow. Is, this is amazing. So the 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 towing companies uh, don't want to tow. They're like, no, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna. I don't want to participate. I don't want anything to do with this. You can't move those rigs without a rig. Are they towing. still there right now? Yes. Oh my God. It's amazing. <laughs> so they cleared the bridge. I understand that they logistically yeah. shut off the bridge to the US, right? Yes. So they've, they've few. cleared, they've, have they cleared that out completely? Yes. Uh, that was, yeah. So, so that's the, the, the weird part, right? So, so the, the, they, they cleared the Windsor Bridge, which is the, the one that has the most sort of amount of, of trade through. And then there were a few other sort of border crossings, right? That are, you know, your show is mostly American audience. So like they would know we have a small little border between Canada and US and a ton of, a ton of crossings. So they closed a few major ones. Right. Um, but you know, there was a, like a, some guns found in a truck. Uh, so, so, you know, all the truckers are like, you know what, we're done with this in, in one of the border crossers. It's like, we don't want to be identified with violence. This was supposed to be peaceful. Everybody left. Uh, so all the borders are cleared essentially. Uh, all that's left is the guys honking in front of parliament <laughs> and it's a party. Like there's kids, they were actually roasting a pig today. It, 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 you know, like there, there's like a jacuzzi in the middle of the street. It, it, it's totally like a party. Uh, and, and the politicians and, and the people who live in Ottawa are the political class, right? Oh, yeah. They don't know how to handle it. Yeah. So they're calling martial law to, to handle that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, it seems like, and, and I think maybe even the bigger part of this, especially when you're looking at it from a global context, is that idea is a seed that's now being planted everywhere. I mean, you're, you saw it uh, being replicated in France. I don't know how that kind of played out. I just saw that there was clashes inside of Paris. Um, but I think Israel. the idea in Israel, you're seeing this seed of an idea about mandates and basically people wanting their freedoms going back to where they were pre-COVID, um, starting to really take root around the world, uh, especially in, in you know 
again, I'm trying to stay as politically ag agnostic on this as possible, but especially when you look at the Omicron variant that, that had um, just drastically less lethal effects on people. I mean, it was, for all intents and purposes, I guess it was very much like the common cold, right? So for your audience, for your audience to get a little bit of context, like in Canada, we had like some pretty draconian rules, right? So for example, have vaccine passports to enter restaurants. You, you know, you can't fly out of the country without a vaccine passport. Mm, yeah. Like, you know, and this truckers really started because, you know, like, and, and listen, I think like Canada is probably like 80, 90% vaccinated. So yeah. like, it, it was really just like politi politicians trying to be mean, really, mm -hmm. like there's essentially no risk statistical risk associated with this yeah so so they essentially wanted to mandate truckers to be vaccinated in order to cross the border but the problem is though like you know like they lose their livelihoods if they don't want to get vaccinated essentially right so you know they're like okay screw this we're all done with this anyways right and, and you know and in canada about half the population is for it half the population is against it it gets very complicated we have a, and I a think public you see that mostly, system. You see most of that uh, from a global context too, is, yeah. in that there's a split. Like, and I think that's what really kind of is forcing the the banging of the heads together between yeah. political parties is you you really do have a split between how people view this. But I, I guess for me, just personally, if I'm going to speak of, of my own opinion, is just the the virus is mutating. The last variant that came through is, for all intents and purposes, very much like a common cold. And so to to kind of be forcing a lot of these policies and a lot of these procedures, uh, I mean, for God's sake, look at the Super Bowl. Not a single person there with a mask on, right? I mean, the, the, the mayor himself it, isn't there, but yet the kids go to school who don't even have concern of catching this oh, thing. They're wearing you know, masks. I have kids. I don't want my kids wearing masks because you yeah. know it's bad for them, right? It's, it really is that yeah. simple. They are not at risk. Uh, and the way you see it, it's like, can we just all go back to like mind your own businesses? You know, like, you know, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. If you want to get vaccinated, yeah. get vaccinated. If you don't want to wear, it, you know, it's just, it's just really so simple. If you're really scared, stay at home. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's forcing you to leave the house. And it's not my, my, you know, my, uh, like fabric mask that's going to prevent you from catching COVID from me anyway. So it's, you know, it, I think people sort of like did a power trip. And we have to hide inflation somehow, right? So COVID is a great narrative for that. And boy, oh boy, what a conversation that is. Um, so you and I, I don't know that we've ever, I know we've talked online about kind of our points of view on, on that particular topic, but um, how do you view this from a financial lens, from a macro lens? Um because it seems like when you got your start, it was much more about the hardware, the kind of the tech, the software of, of Bitcoin. And then maybe you you grew into this this understanding or this knowledge of the the broader macro implications of like what's going down. Um, is that a is that a good characterization of it? Or have you kind of seen the macro back background for since you've been in the space? Uh, you know, I have no background in finance. I was economically illiterate, uh, 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 you know, before Bitcoin. <laughs> so <laughs> this all came with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, but I did grow up in Brazil, right? And and we had multiple currency failures there, and we had uh, uh, bail-ins. Uh, we we had it all. We had capital controls, and, and then we had the delusion of the Brazilian real, which was a, a fascinating experiment. Anyone yeah. who's interested in currency failings or winning. I should read the story of the Brazilian Real because it was essentially just everybody uh, magically making it happen. It was absolutely based on zero. Like there was nothing backing it. It's just, we're all just going to agree that this is going to be one to the one to the dollar and that's it. And they, they what, made it happen. What was it like leading up to that through the failure? Like how would you describe socially what was happening? Oh, the Weimar uh, times. <laughs> really? It, it, yeah, no, it's like the way I like to say it, it's like it's never the way people think this stuff is. It, it, it's sort of like because government is still poking, right? And and you also have like foreign actors sort of like uh, um, uh, causing interference in a pure signal of the economy, right? So, you know, you have multinational companies that come in and they will have like different, you know, they can pay a lot more. 
so so like there's a lot of like big signals in the market but the, the main thing is the market cannot have a clear sort of like a, a, a clear signal of like you know matchmaking right so you're gonna have for example a lot of people looking for employees and then you're gonna have a lot of people without a job so you know it's the market not finding a way of matching those two right because maybe it is that you know the business cannot pay enough right or the government is mandating weird stuff because it's whatever the times dictate the government to mandate some extra stuff right and then you have these other people who may be receiving a check right that's like you know it's 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 not a great check but it's like better than leaving the house to go work right we had this with serb in canada right like businesses could not find people the taxi companies here like they couldn't find taxi drivers even though the taxi driver would make three times what he made from the check so you start having all this 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 disparity of of like matchmaking in the market between labor and employers you start seeing that uh with like like financial products so for example um you're gonna have low interest rates for some stuff that is like highly disposable say buying a fridge in in financing a fridge but then the house price uh the, the house interest for mortgages at least in brazil would have been like super high uh, but now in Canada, we have, say, like, you know, if you want a city house, <laughs> you can get a variable rate 1.5% a year <laughs> on, on a 25-year mortgage, okay? It, 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 it's insane. With 5% down, that's it. Um, 5% <laughs> Okay. Like, it, it, it's, it's, it's insane. Uh, but now they're sort of trying to, to cramp it up a little bit. So they're making so that, you know, you have to do, it's only 5X combined income, uh, the total that they'll land you, um, which is also like, makes it impossible for people to buy a house because the house prices are doing, we did 28% this year, house uh, increase in price. I've heard up in Canada, housing prices just going well. And the irony for me is there's just so much land. There's so much land. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's, but, but, but it's yeah. not that, right? The, the, the problem, I mean, but, but like outside of the cities, like it's worst. It's like two, three X the house price, right? Because it was really mispriced before. There was no interest in a country home. Let's put it this way, right? Like the market was just not there. Mm -hmm. uh, now that people had COVID, uh, here and being prisoners in their houses, they were like, you know, I want more property, I want more land, I want to move out of the city. So that demand spiked. So you have like cottages and country homes going to the reacts. Um, but those you cannot get a mortgage for in the same way, right? So because the I think the government won't guarantee as much for the bank. Um, and then credit cards are going up a lot. The, the line of credits are going up a lot. Um, it, it, it's an absolute like insanity with pricing right the beef i mean it's you, you know like just 15 percent a year over year oh it's it's crazy right now the uh the thing that the meme that you see online is everything's clown world is that what it is that what it felt like in brazil when when it oh, was yeah. going through it was it clown world is that the best way to just kind of summarize it into a fun or like simple phrase I mean, Brazil, politically speaking, has always been clown world. Right? I mean, like, <laughs> hey, hey, everywhere. Like, in the world, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, the last Comey people who were uh, elected for president through a party, I think they spent $300,000 in lobsters. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like, you, you know, like Brazil, like, plays, like, politically speaking, a completely different level of clown world, right? Uh, but funny enough, at least there we have a little bit more polarity in, uh, uh, um, in media. So aside from the main big ones, like there is more media variety for you to consume. So there is like better source of information. In Canada, we don't. There is there's less people, so there's less options. And they're all subsidized by the government now because they're all broke in the last yeah. 10, 20 years. So they're all essentially sp spilling out the message that, you know, the government is not evil, right? It, it, mm. it's, uh, it's fascinating to be watching this. Uh, to me, the, the COVID narrative, the, the reason why they don't want to let go is because, you know, like COVID has been great for them to hide inflation, right? The supply chains, right? That's it. There's absolutely no reason there was all the printing. Canada printed 4X, right? And it was an M2 uh, yeah. Last, yeah. last year. So 
Um, the, the COVID narrative is absolutely perfect, right? It's like we have this thing that's out of our control. Yeah. Look, everybody's having problems with this. It's not just Canada, yeah. right? Uh, and then print, print, print. All right. Uh, smart contracts. Is this something that you see? <laughs> is this something that you see getting built and constructed on top of Bitcoin? Is it something that requires another token? Um, is can you somehow do this on top of Lightning? What are your thoughts on this idea of smart contracts uh, in Bitcoin? Uh, I, I don't think the the smart contract that people want to have, like the Ethereum style thing, is going to happen on Bitcoin. Uh, Remember, like Bitcoin's purpose is to replace central banking, right? It's on the Genesis block. The, the, like we're not going to make any single trade-off that will cause any erosion of that immutability of the, the monetary supply, block size, uh, and, and, you know, how mining works. So, you know, it's not going to change, right? Um, I think Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin can provide two smart contracts that that no other system can provide is a is an immutable source of truth, right? So you can anchor stuff you want to do on the Bitcoin blockchain, and and people try to do that in projects back in the day, but you know it wasn't the time, right? Um, I think the time is starting to come, and people are starting to do stuff, um, especially with Lightning, right? So you know Lightning in a way is kind of a smart contract, um, you, you know it's not like a, a Turing complete. One, like, but you know, you do have two parties, and you're essentially sending a UTXO between each other without spending it. Um, and there is this discrete log contracts that are coming uh, that that you can add uh, essentially like a, an oracle to something. Um, what do you, th what do you think it, about those? Do you think that there's some promise there, or do you think this just hype? You know, it depends on what you want to do, right? I, I mean, like. Pretty much everything that's done in smart contracts nowadays is it's like essentially mostly centralized and could be done in a database, right? So <laughs> aim aim into that, <laughs> right? I mean, it's Web three is a big database, right? Uh, so, but, but where are all the VCs going to pump their money there? You no, know, but this this is ultimately the problem, right? I mean, yeah. Bitcoin disintermediates uh, middlemen, and and like the VC model of the last say 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, has been really honed down to be the perfect middleman that creates a monopoly, right? I mean, that's literally Peter Thiel's thesis, right? Yes. <laughs> that's so true. It is. It literally so, is. So, and, and it makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's a great thesis to make money. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin sort of removes that, right? Um, so the, the smart contract stuff is possible and, and it's happening, especially with landing and, and those sort of features. And, 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 and I think... As true need, true utility comes, right? I think we can sort of like resolve those issues with Bitcoin being the, 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 the original source of truth for at least the place where you dump your liquidity. Because you don't want to like, see, money that I hold in Bitcoin, I go to bed and I sleep, right? If I was holding Ethereum, <laughs> I probably wouldn't sleep, right? So, you know, all these contracts and all these people are still sort of like, find their place of resting, right? Where, where they park the capital they made, the profit they made in, the, in Bitcoin, right? Uh, um, so how that plays out is, is interesting, especially with the stable coins and all that stuff. I'm sure they're rolling 99 dice. <laughs> 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 what does the UX in this space look like? in five or seven years from now? This was a question that uh, Marshall had had asked some of these questions. I thought these were really good questions. Um, so like your cold card today and just most people with a hardware wallet, um, when I'm thinking like where we're at in five to seven years from now, I think Apple, Google, some of these major players are going to be entering the space. Um, so what does what does the UX look like? How do they integrate into this space and do it in a way that still allows self custody? Because I think that there's going to be a huge demand for that. Uh, but what do you what do you see this being? It's a it's a it's a kind of like a funny question because thinking about Bitcoin seven years from now is like it, it's. <laughs> I mean, what happened in the last ten? I mean, yeah, you just look at the, what years. happened in the last seven years. It's just you know it's crazy. Um, but so. So first, it's like you're never going to be able to trust, 
right? The, 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 the Apple phone or the Google phone is just, just, you can't, right? It's all closed down. It's all non-verifiable. It's extremely complex. Like, even if you could trust them, right? You know, like, you simply cannot trust a general purpose computer because the attack surface is just ginormous, right? Uh, what I think they'll be great at is providing you with a safe wallet that is for small amounts of money. But remember, your carrier can still remote access your phone. Okay, so they could maybe remote cancel your wallet, right? So you can't if it's based on their chips and all that stuff, right? But even with the wallets on the phone, I mean, technically they can't, right? They have access to the baseband that shares memory with the with the phone. So they could technically see you generating the private key. So you simply cannot trust it. So um, what we are doing uh, is uh, we're making this, this uh, uh, essentially NFC cards, right? Uh, that you can just tap on the phone uh, the, the, the security profile and trade-offs are different than code card, right? This is not for your eternal wealth, right? Yeah. But essentially, you're going to go like, oh, I want to sign this transaction, right? Like send money, you know, like to buy a phone, right? So it's like a like real money, but not your wealth. You know, you just tap on the back of the phone and you sign the transaction. Or it's maybe multi-sig. The, the wallet has one key that has maybe... Um, you know, I only allow you to spend, say, a thousand dollars per day, either because dad dad said it or because you said it, so that if it gets robbed, it's not an issue, and you use the card to co-sign that. Right? Um, you're going to see a lot of NFC coming. Uh, Square announced they're going to do uh, NFC. Uh, the the Mark IV uh, uh, has NFC on it. Um, I think that that's. That's how I see a lot of the stuff going the next, say, five years, right? It's it's the NFC as a means of an easy, quick UX. Um, I think that once Taproot starts to get more interesting in scripting, we might be able to de-risk devices by having more complex threshold signatures between them. Uh, then, then you, you know, you don't have to trust the phone as much. So maybe one day, cold card doesn't exist anymore, right? Maybe we just, that's 10 years, 20 years from now, the scripting became so, so smart and so good and so de-risked that like you could have 50 devices and, and then it's all sort of spread, right? And, and it's not a concern, but we're definitely far from and, that. And so for people who aren't maybe understanding what, you, what you're getting at from the technical front, so similar to like how you have three different Apple devices and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to ping the three of them and-, and yep. You're secure. So you're talking it, it because of Taproot and because of the scripting that can be done through that update that just went through with, with Bitcoin. You think that maybe they could get to something like that in the future? Uh, yeah, uh, it, I, I think there's limits, uh, uh, like being very realistic, but I think a lot can be done. And, mm -hmm. and a lot can be sort of reimagined and sort of like refought and more yeah. maybe upgrades come. Uh, but I think it's possible to do a lot more on the middle ground. Right. I, I think when you're talking about generational wealth, you're talking about like real money, like the, the level of security, the level of uh, a forward error correction, forward thinking needs to be much greater. Right. That's why I want to trust minimize like a very simple device that is like fully verifiable and, and you know, you do your dice and, and, you know, because we simply don't know and you might be dead. Right. Like your kids might have this private key that you generated. Right? Maybe their grand grandkids have the same private key still, right? So you know, making sure you are doing your 256 bits and and sort of like like in their good bits that, that part of your legacy. Roll your you? dice. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I think your great grandkids uh, will be proud of you. <laughs> yes, it's like that. It didn't get it robbed. <laughs> okay. How do you think about securities concerns? of the components of the hardware uh, when you think about the upstream supply chain. So you're receiving components, uh, you know, maybe some are more complex than others, but to think that you have absolute control of everything that you're kind of sticking in any type of hardware these days uh, is just, you know, there's no way. So how do you, how do you think through that? I know that all your manufacturing is done there in Canada. 
Um, but I know you're probably receiving some parts from China or wherever uh, components inside of your inside of your hardware. So how do you think about that? The upstream uh, risks. Yeah, we receive parts from all over the world. Uh, it's very simple. We don't trust anything. <laughs> yeah. So assume it's compromised, right? That that's our sort of like way of thinking about this stuff. It's just you assume everything is compromised, uh, and you essentially don't trust the parts. Right. So, for example, we store your seed in the secure element. But, you know, we all know the state actors probably have a backdoor in that secure element. And also, and also nothing is unhackable. Right. So give it enough resources. Somebody will get in eventually. Right. I mean, Ledger spent, you know, like half a million dollars in gear and probably like a million dollars in like just staff, like breaking the, the cold card mark too. you, you know, like. The three resolve the problems, but you know it's a matter of time, and somebody's going to figure out a way. Um, is it repeatable and all that stuff? That's a different story, right? Like good luck. But um, but the key here is, so for example, the the seed is encrypted with a key from the other manufacturer's chip, and then it's stored in this manufacturer's chip. So now we're playing two chips against each other, right? Mark four is going to have another secure element. <laughs> now you have to break three parts, right, to get two secrets. Um, and that's not even counting the passphrase and everything else you can do and you should do. But like, we're just trying to play in a way that like we're raising, because nothing is impossible, but we're just raising the time and cost and failure of attack so high, right, that essentially becomes silly. And, and for, you're for not even try to break it. And you're not even talking multi-sig, right? Yeah, you're exactly. Not even, no, you're not even this talking is, a multi-sig wallet. Yeah, this is like plain Jane yeah. wallet, right? It's still fairly secured, right? Because remember, you also want to defend the firmware, right? Because you don't want the firmware. That's why, like, having a secure element is so much more than just the 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 seed protection per se, right? You want to make sure that the firmware is not tampered with because that firmware could lie to you. And the firmware can see your seed when it's operating, right? So to protect all those secrets, we want to create this sort of like whack-a-mole game that has high failure rate for the attacker. Um, and that's sort of like how we play the game theory on the design of the device um, and, and how we don't trust supply chains. It's, it really is that simple because you can't. Yeah, no. Hey, speaking of which, uh, how have, what, what do you think about the supply chains right now? Are you seeing them getting any better or are you still seeing uh, delays in deliverables? Well, I mean, everything started to get slow on the beginning of COVID because of like everybody said, you know, I don't want to take public transportation. So everybody decided to buy a car, right? This was early uh, 2020, right? And the same chips that we use car manufacturers use, right? Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, they get priority, but uh, we're pretty good at buying parts. And we bought, you know, for the next uh, device, we bought uh, parts for the whole year worth of manufacturing, and like we can just make them now. Um, but it, it sucks because, you know, China was super delayed with like just logistics per se. So like, you know, a lot of our stuff doesn't come through ships, so we don't have to worry too much about that except when we buy big machines. Um, but, so, but because the container ships were all slow, everything got moved to airplanes. So now the airplanes are getting sent back with orders that shouldn't go in an airplane. <laughs> so if you want to buy, say, uh, uh, oh, dual press planches, right? They used to be like cheap and, and they come on a ship and you know, max three months you have them, right? You know, you were starting to look at like six months a year. And you're not going to send these things in an airplane because it, it, it's going to make it cost five times. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had to buy this big laser machine to etch the the new uh, uh, NFC cards. Um, it's like a reasonably sized industrial machine, right? Uh, you know, you normally come on a on a ship, cheap. We had to put it in an airplane, and that was a fortune. <laughs> the airplane ride was more expensive than the machine. Hey, uh, all right. The last question I got for you here. Um, when we think about uh, <laughs> this is kind of a generic one, I'm talking about Bitcoin price action. Uh, we we go through these big run-ups 
And uh, it seems that there's some type of narrative or something that kind of drives, uh, whether it's the having event or it's Facebook's trying to do their own Libra. We saw a massive run up uh, from that. Um, is there a catalyst that you kind of see that, that's going to play out or something that you think is going to drive the next big wave of, of people coming inbound into the space? I mean, you, I guess you could even argue that this stuff happening in Canada right now could be a, a potential catalyst, but is there anything that you kind of see playing out that you think is going to drive a lot of that? I mean, Russia just announced that they like Bitcoin now, right? So yeah. uh, can you imagine if Russia tells Europe, uh, so do you know all the energy you need from us? Well, we want to get paid in Bitcoin. I mean, that, that would be like... I'm with you. It, it's, that would it's, be it's like, insane. No, it's over. It's like full capitulation of fiat. I mean, just because of the drive of Bitcoin the, and then you have like the self-fulfilling cycle, right? Of like people see the price go up, they go into this thing too and just... And then there is the Russian story with the ammonium nitrate too, right? Yeah, yeah. The 60% producer and, you know, those guys want to be off the dollar, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you have, you know, the, the thing between China and Russia, it's a different story. They're going to be happy to print their own monies and send to each other there. Um, you know, I, I think... If we have more of these sort of Canada style bank banking, like illegal seizure of money, I mean, you know, people are going to smarten up and not have money anymore in these banks, right? Because a lot of people don't understand that like the, 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 the foreign bank account is not what it used to be. Like nowadays, all these banks are on their, like they, they all talk to, to, to daddy IRS, right? Like, there, there really is very little escape for that, except for stable coins. Stable coin is the new sort of like Swiss bank account, right? For people that want dollars. And a lot of that flows through Bitcoin. Not because it's running on top of Bitcoin, but flows through Bitcoin. Um, and uh, I, I think the demand for that has been insane. It's going to grow a lot more and then a lot more. And, uh, you know, and then there is inflation. I mean, it's almost like there's no aspect of of life, of econo like or, or economy or or politics or that does not point to a essentially event horizon for Bitcoin, right? I mean, like this is just nothing. I mean, I, I look outside, right? I talk to people. Everything just points to a Bitcoin demand, just based on you know the economics and everything else the society has done for the last hundred years, right? It, it, it's there's no escaping that, um, you know, like, thankfully we have Bitcoin. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, if, if there's any uh, Canadian politicians listening to this conversation with NVK and myself, I just want to put out there, he makes the best dice and makes the best calculators in Canada. Um, <laughs> NVK, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, if people want to find out more about you, want to find out about your, your products, uh, give them a handoff where they can learn more. Uh, go for the products, go to coinkite.com. Uh, and then on Twitter, we have a, a million accounts there, uh, at coinkite is one of them. And then, uh, you can find me at, at NVK, uh, November Victor Kilo. <laughs> we will have links to all this in the show notes for folks. If you, if you don't remember or whatever, just go to the show notes. You can click on the links that we'll have there. And uh, MVK, thank you so much for making time. This was long overdue, and I thoroughly enjoy learning from you. You're just such a wealth of knowledge. So thanks for coming on the show. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Great questions. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.